to the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, we have four members present tonight. Uh, one missing, Lisa Wise is out this evening. Our upcoming board meetings, April 11th, 2019, will be a public work session at the administration office at 6 p.m. April 15th, 2019, will be a regular meeting at Bentown Elementary School at 6 p.m. May 16th, 2019, will be a public work session at the administration office at 6 p.m. May 20th, 2019, will be a regular meeting at Akron Elementary at 6 p.m. June 13, 2019, will be a public work session at the administration office at 6. June 17, 2019, will be a regular meeting at Mentone Elementary School at 6 p.m. Move on to Spotlight on the Valley. Number one, welcome and introduction of new employees. Thank you. Um, I think we've got one uh, new employee here this evening, uh, Mr. Billy Gilman. Mr. Gilman, could you please stand? Uh, Mr. Gilman is going to be uh, working in our technology department elementary level down at Mentone and Akron. So welcome to Billy. Can, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, well, I was a part-time evening custodian for Mrs. Mills at Akron, and then my wife encouraged me to go back to school, get a degree. So I worked a little bit part-time in Akron, and then I became a part-time tutor at uh, Ivy Tech, where I got my degree. And then got an internship at the Bowen Center, and that's where I'm at right now. So it's a kind of bittersweet to leave there. It's a nice, nice work environment. But I think this will be nice help in the community. We appreciate you uh, coming on board, and appreciate your, your your wife and what she does with our art program, and your your outstanding three sons. They're, they're great kids. We appreciate it. Thank you. I'd like to move on to. Uh, Recognizing the following donations and donors, uh, we've moved this item up into the spotlight of the valley. Uh, we, we will, or I will ask you in new business to uh, approve these donations, but um, we'd like to recognize uh, Tucker Golden Beef LLC. They've graciously made a donation in support of our stop, our bus stop arm cameras uh, to support safety of our students in, our, in the county. Also, we'd like to accept a uh, donation from the Northern Indiana Community Foundation, specifically the Tom Wilson Memorial Fund. They've donated uh, $1,450 to be used for stop arm camera systems in our buses. Uh, we really appreciate those two donations. Uh, we're grateful for the outpouring of community support uh, to, to help our uh, students be safe within the, the community. Uh, we also have a donation uh, from Donors Choose, and it's with the uh, Tippecanoe Valley Middle School uh, nurses, uh, a donation of hygiene supplies. And then uh, Woodlawn Hospital, our fourth donation, uh, they are donating flashing safety lights to each student uh, at Tippecanoe Valley and Rochester Caston uh, for, to attach to backpacks as an additional safety guard for children in our communities. So I will ask you to approve those in new business. Um, with that being said, we'd like to move on to spotlight uh, for the high school, Mr. Schreiber. And um, Mr. Schreiber, do we want to try the lights? <coughs> Good deal, and thank you very much for uh, coming to the high school. Guys are welcome anytime. It's great to have you here. So, um, all right. So, a few things that we just really want to talk about here uh, right away are just uh, really focusing on the PLCs. Anyway, this is something you guys have heard a lot about, and uh, very excited that we're committed to the PLCs and we're all big believer. And we made a lot of changes here at the high school to how the PLC process works and uh, how those things kind of go. So, Mr. Allen, you can hit it. There we go. Um, and the biggest change that you're going to see right away is we moved away from grade level teams where we had a freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, PLC to really focusing in on content areas. And one thing the teachers really asked a lot for was, well, how, especially after we took uh, 
more teachers to Minnesota over the summers, how can we get more time? How is that going to kind of work? And if you recall last year at this time, we also talked about changing the, the schedule to go into a seven period day and how can that all work in? Well, if you notice over there on the right, we have that SSR time. And SSR, you're going to hear a little bit more about later, uh, stands for uh, sustained silent reading. But also that's a time during the day where we build into the schedule where our teachers get to collaborate as PLC teams in, in their content areas. And then you can see we have math and English going to meet three times a week, and this will be in addition to the collaboration time that we have built into Tuesdays and Thursdays. And this is extremely valuable time. Obviously, with math and English being your major accountability, they're the ones that we get for three days. And if I could find a way to have every content area have three days, I would. Uh, but what you can see there is science, social studies, and foreign language then be twice a week, and then everybody else we have a way for them to meet during the during the week and just find extra time uh, to collaborate and work together as a team. It's been an extremely effective uh, way of doing things. Um, real positive comments from the teachers who you'll hear more about. Uh, but to have that time built in the schedule has really, really worked out well for us this year. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. All right. In addition to that, one thing that came up when we were in Minnesota was just really talking about, okay, well, we get PLCs and, and but, but we want to find other ways to do things, and uh, just a way to empower teachers. And so what we also did is every teacher is going to be on their content area PLC, and then they're also on uh, a collaborative team where they're either looking at data or literacy or leadership, uh, looking at our technology team. We have a, a, a public relations team that you'll hear from tonight. Uh, we have a team that just focuses on school celebrations. Uh, and these, these teams have just done amazing things this year. I'm very, very proud of the work that they put in. They usually meet on that Thursday morning time slot, as a general rule, uh, but not always. Um, but these guys have just done some great things, and you're going to see uh, all, a little bit of their work here today. So very, very proud uh, of all the other teams we have besides um, their content area teams. Which we couldn't have done this unless we have that schedule with that built-in time where our content area teams can meet. So, uh, I got to share this. You know, for those who don't know, that's data from Star uh, Star Trek: New Generation. Uh, Shelly Eagle, I want you to come up. She asked me today, "Who's the creepy guy you put in front of data team?" She had no idea that was data. So she's obviously not a she's obviously not a Trekkie. Yes, no. Um, so what I want is I'm going to bring Shelly up here first, and they're just uh, she's going to talk about some of the English data that's up there. So that'll be the next slide. Go ahead, Shelly. Okay, I'm actually, uh, do you want to talk now too? No, I'll do that. Okay. All right, so what you see here is a, is a graph that has just a lot of information on it. Um, and I'm going to kind of give you the short version of that. Um, our students meet several times a week for math RTI and English RTI. Um, primarily this year we focus on our sophomores and making sure that they have all the skills they need to be successful in our 10th grade classrooms as well as um, in, on our ISTEP testing that we have. Um, so this data that I have in front of you is NWEA data, okay? We do three rounds of NWEA. Um, generally the first round, as soon as we come to school, um, we give them a day or so to acclimate and then we have them take NWEA testing just to see where they're at. Um, the second round generally happens right around October-ish um, and that's after, this data that you're seeing is after nine weeks of intense intervention where we are working on all of those skills that they're lacking, those, um, you know, anything from reading comprehension to sort of writing skills, you know, we're focusing very intently upon those skills that kids need to be successful readers in our classrooms. Um, so this first round of data, you'll see there's ninth graders, 10th graders, 11th graders, um, and we have four categories that we kind of look at that are represented here. We look at lots of different things, um, but this is just a small sampling of what we're looking at. So this first category is what we consider passing and growing. So if we were to give kids the, the benchmark, which the 10th grade benchmark is ISTEP, if we were to give them that benchmark, they are likely to pass it based on NWBA, and then also they're growing. From the first round when we took when we when we excuse me took it when we came back from school uh, from the break in August to the time that we reassessed them in October they are growing they have achieved some level of growth and for some of those students an average NWEA growth an average year's worth of growth is four points some of these students did four points in one sitting some of these students did 25 points in one setting okay so the interventions that we were able to see from our round two our interventions are working. Okay. 
So um, we have a secondary category is they're passing, but they're not growing. And that's valuable data too. Obviously, the ideal data is everybody's passing, everybody's growing, we're all doing quite well. But this is wonderful data for us because then we know who specifically needs a, a higher level of intervention. Okay, so we can provide them more steps or more things that they need. Um, so that's wonderful. We have our not passing but growing. Okay, that's a wonderful category. Those numbers are our highest. Um, so that combines to the percent successful is our those first three categories all together. We've uh, attempted at our intervention to be a success at that moment. Um, and then we have our last category, not passing and not growing. That's when the good conversations are really starting to develop because we're doing all these things to make kids successful and if they're not passing, they're not growing, then we're talking to every single teacher that's in contact with that kid. We are just working, working, working to get as much data as we can. Now it's not up here, but I'm going to share a statistic with you that's not up here. Um, the sophomore class in particular, um, we, from the first round to the second round, achieved 475 points worth of growth. It was like 475 points worth of growth overall, okay? We had 129 kids test. Now, I'm not a math person, but that's some pretty good numbers per kid, okay? Um, so then our, our third round, which we, we tested them as soon as they come back from Christmas break. And the mentality behind that is, if they know it after Christmas break, by golly, they know it. Um, and we know that that's true learning that's occurred for them. So the numbers for the third round are, don't look as impressive on paper, but when you sit and you work with these kids, it's still, they've still got it and they, they've achieved growth. Our average growth after our, all of our rounds of intervention, we're still averaging right around 300 points worth of growth from the beginning of the school year till January. We have no other NWEA assessments. The only thing that we're relying upon is what our teachers are saying. And so our data team has asked our teachers, what are, what are you saying? You know, what are you noticing about our kids? And our kids are growing. They are saying the right things. They're doing the right things. And they're just, they've impressed us beyond belief. So um, when we look at reading data, which I have language data too, but you guys would like to go home tonight, I'm sure. Um, so the, the numbers that we have here, uh, I'm happy to elaborate any further, but uh, we have some good stuff here. Is there any questions I can answer for that? Okay. Thank you. I, I can't say enough just how much time and effort the data team, but also math and English have put into RTI, which we'll talk a little bit when we get into the whole PLC process here in a minute, but just RTI is, you know, response to intervention and just being really data driven really looking at our data and knowing what it means. You know, you walk around the hallways and you should be able to ask the kid, hey, what was your NWA score? They should be able to tell you. Uh, that's a big improvement than where we were two years ago. So really being data driven and really understanding, okay, how do I use that data for evidence-based instruction? Uh, Shelley in the English department did an awesome job on that's has math. Uh, they, they've just done a great job putting this all together. Uh, this is math. Um, I think you understood those four, four categories, you know, Mr. Conley challenged at the beginning of the year, all means all, and certainly we want all kids to pass that test, that would be great, but that growth is, is really one thing you're really looking at. Where were you started, okay, and where are you at now? Um, we really debated a little bit about where to test, and, and we really like the idea of testing right after January. So if you look at the bottom of round three, yeah, those numbers are a little lower, but we knew that. We knew that coming in after two weeks off and then doing you know, who knows what, and Christmas and everything else, we, we knew that they would drop, but we really feel confident that if you can do it right after you get back from Christmas break or winter break, we can feel it comes time for I-STEP, you can do that. You know, we just had our first round I-STEP. It was amazing to see just our kids' confidence, uh, some of their scratch papers, uh, what they were writing down. You can really tell that the interventions and the work that math and English and the data team were doing are, are, are really, really good. So. Um, these are really our main formulas we look at during the, in the data. Yeah. All right, next up, we got our public relations team. Come on, Kim. Come on, Deb, you coming up too? Yep. Anybody else on public relations? Come on up. Crystal, come on. Matt, come on up. Uh, these guys have done an amazing job. Uh, hopefully you've seen the newsletter. I'm sure you've seen some of the videos. I'm not going to take any more of their thunder. I'll let them uh, talk about what they're doing in there. Well, uh, we are part of the public relations and at the beginning of the year, Mr. Cripe approached us and said he was going to do this. And you know, I was a actually a public relations 
relations major in college until college, until you know, education called for you, I guess. So it was fun to put some of our uh, my skills to use doing this. But basically, our goal is to promote TVHS. Probably everybody in here knows all the awesome things happening inside these walls, but the people outside don't know. So our goal is to you know basically promote it. We want people to see some of the amazing things we're publishing, putting out there, and go, that's why my kids go to Valley. Or we want that person to look at it and go, hey, maybe we should consider this for our family. So we're working at bridging that communication with our stakeholders, which is you know, our students, our parents, community members. Um, we're also just working at being a, having a bigger presence on social media. Lori has been awesome at that. She's, you know, we send her things and she has it out within minutes on you know Twitter and um, Facebook. She's taught many of us um, how to use Twitter. So um, we're you know getting a little bit up there with our 21st century skills. <laughs> started out um, putting together a newsletter that was really archaic because that's all I knew because you know, I'm the whole one. Um, so we got, uh, we were able to purchase a uh, license for the S'mores newsletter which was really nice. Um, it allows us to do a lot of different things. We can do email on it, we can put videos on it, we can customize it, all of that kind of thing. Our first newsletter, we hit 202 people and then our next newsletter, you can see how many we have. 475 visitors. The map down there is all the people um, that have visited us on our last newsletter. I mean, we've already we've gone all over the place. We've gone to Mexico, everywhere that anybody has anybody. So, just getting our, our name out there and what we're doing is just a really good thing. We also figured out after we did it, but we also figured out that there's a way to do it through the S'mores application where we can put everybody's email in and then they will track who's actually opened it, who's actually viewed it, how long they viewed it. Well, we did that, we found that all out after we did the last newsletter. So that'll be on the next one. So. But we're really happy with the, the way it, the community has accepted it. So I have a quick question. Yes. So how do you get on the newsletter? <laughs> well, we just have to put your name on we, we put and it on Facebook. You get the community and everybody mm -hmm. responds. We just basically what we did is we asked Mr. Lane to give us a list of all the parents that were in the school and all of their emails. So what we did is we took all of the emails, so it was 575, and we put them on a regular mass email and sent it out that way. Um, so what we can do is we can get more emails in and then we can attach those in as well. It's always on the TVHS um, uh, Facebook page. There's always a link to it there as well. Of trying to grow this, you know, we're trying as much as we can as, as we're learning the program and as we're learning to get out to the community all the different things we have we're adapting as best as quickly as we can. One really cool thing too about the newsletter is it goes right to Spanish too. And that's kind of what sold us on the S'mores program is it you know, automatically and that's why we went with the license we went with because there were several different options so we do have that and the great thing is is this like Debbie said was just a touch of the data we can see like all over and we have statistics we can see you know how many people were reached by email it's just provided a, a wealth of knowledge for us and we hope to grow the people. So, so Debbie if someone wants to sign up for the newsletter they can go to the, the home website of the corporation. You can go to the home website or you can uh, contact any one of us, you can email us that way, and then just give us your email, and then we'll just attach it. Um, I have the privilege of talking to you about our videos. So, early in the year, we knew we had to get some videos out there, just so much that we could share through video. Uh, so, we started out, we were just researching videos, looking at uh, good videos that different uh, schools and organizations have put out. And so we kept uh, going from there, collaborating, uh, collaborating with other teachers, Mr. Ingrid, Mr. Franklin, uh, eventually started working with Mr. Ingrid and his work-based learning um, students and really started getting some great videos produced. Um, and the views that they have, that they have received have been great. I don't know the number, I don't know if you know any of the numbers on the views. Not but the top of my head, but in the thousands. 
they have, I think, exceeded our expectations and seem to just be getting better. Uh, the sports video, uh, the Ag FFA video, they were both made through the work-based learning and were excellent. Um, Nate Roberts, uh, if you don't know Nate, you just look behind the camera there. Um, <laughs> he will. He has produced a video that will be released this Friday, and that is with uh, Fax Program, Mrs. Landis. And so that will be this Friday. And um, also Sneak Peek. So Valley Sneak Peek video, this is one where we got pictures, got uh, student life, and put it onto, um, onto a video. It can be put together, and it's excellent as well. And all of these are available um, that you can find through Facebook page, also the newsletter. And upcoming, uh, we have a work-based learning and CTE video. That data is also creating for us. <laughs> nice. So this year we've, we've really implemented um, science and sustained reading and every classroom, and we're, we're really proud of that, every classroom has a, a pretty hefty collection of books in there for them to read. Even Mr. Shara's class out here that meets in this room, just in the teacher workroom, there's a whole bunch of uh, books in there for the kids to have. And the, the expectation is, um, well, silent, obviously, but the, the, the idea of sustained reading, we turn off the tablets, it's only books. Um, you know, as English teachers in our department, we've got books in their hands for a whole lot of different things. So we're really proud of that initiative, and it seems like after a little bit of struggle um, with some of the, you know, upperclassmen especially, but now I think everybody seems to be on board. So, fair? Perfect. Good. Um, we also, and, and Mrs. Michael, uh, Mrs. Lenfesty, and several of us were, were part of what, when we went to see uh, Dr. Anthony Muhammad on December 3rd, Help me off that date. I think that's right. Um, we didn't know, you know, the idea was we we're going to leave the, the, the students behind here. And so we put together a pretty hefty reading regimen for the entire day. And so, if you guys want to speak to any of that, I don't know if you want to. Well, students had different centers that they went to in a certain area of the building, and we had about five centers in the library that I can speak to, and, and we had centers where all students have been trained to log in the library catalog, they can take a look at the books that we had on there, they could actually make reviews of the books that they had read, they could make recommendations to each other about books that they would encourage their friends to read. We had training on digital ebooks and audiobooks that they could access that we get free through the local public library, so that was pulling in some of Agnes Carnegie Hoopla through Bell Memorial. And then they also even had the option of audiobook centers where they could get together as a group and listen to books that way. So that was my center. There were foreign language centers where students could read books in foreign languages. There was silence. There was tech reading. Students who wanted to read and listen to music at the same time if they wanted two things going on could do that. So students were allowed to get up and move around, but yet each center was focused on reading music. And it took so much planning. I can't even tell you how many times we we stayed till 8 o'clock, at least, you know, several times, I think. So putting all that together, and, and it was really, really, really cool to come back and see because the kids were all in basically the library hallway working hard. And we put together this rewards program that, you know, each of those things required, obviously, some work, but then they were worth a certain amount of points. Um, and so the, the winning teams got a, uh, you know, $50 gift card to Amazon. Second place was, I think, a $25 gift card. And I think we have a couple of $25 gift cards. So um, there's, We've also had a handful of, of kind of smaller initiatives, I, I would say. We've got out in front of our classrooms now, you know, what I'm reading, what I just read, what I'm reading, what I'm going to read um, afterwards. I think that's in front of everybody's classrooms now, too. So I think the staff is now on board as well. Oh, yeah, we've, we've been doing reading posters as well. Um, 
those of you who've been around for a while, about 10 years ago we started that, kind of got away from it for a little while, and now we're back to it. We rocks posters. So. I would tell you guys, you know, we had the opportunity to go see Anthony Muhammad. I believe we took 30 teachers to go do that. That's not would never have been possible without the work that they put in to make it so our students had stuff to do during the day. And it was valuable, it was learning, it was all about literacy. So these guys did a great job. Uh, I'm really, really thankful for that. And then, you know, when you talk about PLCs and the power of PLCs, um, so one day I made the you know, mistake the principal makes is, uh, you know, I had this meeting that these teams met on Tuesday. Ms. Michael, who I, I already know you guys know, she's awesome. We're so blessed to have her. She's like, well, hey, can you move it on Thursday? She goes, I want to be on my team. I've got my leaders literacy team. I want to be on a team. I've never got to be on a team. So it's been great to have her. And now um, we have our morning collaboration teams on Thursday. So very good. Um, but it's been awesome to have these guys because they've done a great job. All right, Mr. Ebrecht. Technology team is up next. Realizing that I'm the only one here. Yeah. The technology team is very lovely. With the technology team, we obviously started with the, the point, you know, what do we want students to learn? And then from there, from there we, we start to think, you know, in the classroom, what are the technologies that we are using or that we need to use? And so you guys can see just some of the technologies that we've touched on. OneNote is our platform that we use to uh, upload agendas so that if, if students are gone, they can easily get on it and see what, what they've missed for the day. Uh, it's a file sharing platform so that we can uh, push documents out to our students. And there's even spots for them to turn in things on there as well. Uh, so that was helpful kind of running through OneNote. Helping teachers, we had a lot of new teachers this year that were not as familiar with OneNote, so kind of catching them up and then working with people to see where they're at. Uh, I think we had two go rounds of the OneNote PD. Uh, the, the first one was less successful as the second one. I think we, we made a lot more gains on the second PD. Uh, GoFormative is another platform that we looked at, and we thought this is this is a, a really good platform for formative checks along the way. How do we know that students are learning what they're learning? Uh, and again, new teachers or just teachers that had been maybe less uh, willing to try it in the past. And so we started creating videos, uh, uploaded them to uh, something called Stream. It's uh, through Office 365. All of our teachers have access to that. Uh, and so there, there are videos that explain different things, uh, different features of GoFormative. And June Yazel is our expert on uh, GoFormative. I think she's. If she's not on the board yet for GoFormative, she will probably will be soon. Uh, but she gets all sorts of updates and then uh, sends them on to us. And then the last area um, was OneDrive. And that's actually something that we just recently did. Uh, OneDrive is basically, uh, it's our fail safe. So for too long, people have saved documents on our computers and on our servers. And uh, as reliable or unreliable as they are, so OneDrive is uh, just basically, we, we sat down with all the teachers and said, this is something that you need to do. And really, it's something that I expect my students to do. You can't save documents on your computer on the server and expect them to be around forever. Because computers break, servers go bad. Uh, and so we just had a chance to say, hey, back up your stuff on, on the OneDrive. Uh, it's a good idea. But yeah, we, we, we focus in on, on what, what will be beneficial for students. And, I think it's nice to when, when we do run these professional development activities. It's not somebody coming into our, to our classroom saying, "Hey, you need to do this." It, it's us teachers getting together and saying, well, "What do students need to know, and what do we need to know to improve our classroom?" So uh, I think we're doing good. And these guys have done a great job just uh, training. As a staff, we have some rock stars that can do the technology all day and are great. And then you know we have teachers on flip phones. Not <laughs> no, uh, you know, and, and, and uh, I will say this too. Uh, I had to get you one shot. I'm sorry. Um, but uh, you know, when, when, when you talk about like Go Formative, for example, Shrive is one of the experts, and uh, I know Jessica's probably called me at least three times and said, "Hey, we're ready to order paper. We're ready to order paper." I'm like, Jessica, we're good. And one thing we challenged the staff was if we can put it on the computer and, that, and that's going to serve the same educational purpose, then go ahead and do that. 
the go formative really allows that to happen. And, and our staff has done a great job of, of pushing it out there. It really lets you have that formative. It lets you uh, grade it instantly for you. You can really see, uh, you know, what, what standards you're really focusing on, which ones you're not. So these guys have done a great job pushing that out and rolling it out. One time we had the middle school came over, and uh, they also were involved in the PD. So I really thank these guys for all the time that they put in to uh, not only explore those options, but you know, teach them how to do it. So they've done a great job. Here's one quick question. So is this new uh, the, the technology team. Technology that, teams are brand these are all brand new. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Um, and then the fires go forward. So what's what's it look like? You know, this is this year. Are we going to challenge different technologies for the students in the upcoming years? Are we going to repeat? How does that look like? I mean, I, I yeah. love what you're doing. Don't you? I think well, it's no, great. I no, think it's a great question. Um, I, I think the first thing right now is just getting all your teachers up to speed. You know, getting on yeah, one note is hard. Yeah. Getting on, getting that to to work uh, and just understand. I came from using Google a lot and Google Classroom, which OneNote's the Microsoft version, but just learning all those. And, and, but right now, all of our teachers do have, all their classes are on OneNote, so students absolutely can find out what they did that day. I think we're right now just the point really perfecting these three things, sure. and then once we get there, being able to develop further. But sure, no, it's, no, no, it's great, because I mean, not only will help the kids that want to go to college, they're going to see all this in college, the kids that are going into the workforce, it's going to help those kids, because a lot of time you're going to see that stuff in the workforce. I see it all over, so this is good. Absolutely. And, and any of these, I don't think it's like a one and done thing. Yeah, I think it's, it, in some cases, it starts a conversation and then teachers can come back to us. Uh, I mean, I know there's teachers here that said, hey, can you, you know, can you work with me on this? Just, you know, come and take a look at my computer. For sure. Yeah, so, that's good. Thank you. Okay, um, really the last thing on professional learning communities, come on up, Stacy, here next. Um, is uh, when we went to Anthony Muhammad uh, over at Manchester and just really looked at the PLC, they really kind of put out there four questions for you to determine, well, where are you at? And so really four ways to look at, you know, where are you at with your curriculum being aligned? Where are you at with common formative assessments? Where are you at with your RTI or your tiered interventions? And where are you at with enrichment? And so we really took a look at, uh, you know, our alignment. Uh, we're very, very, very thankful to have Stacy from prior away from Scott middle school. Uh, she's a huge asset to us and so I was going to Stacy just talk about uh, curriculum alignment. We have something we call Yellow Sheet Day. So. Well and I love Yellow Sheet Day because Anthony Muhammad talked about at his school they called it Yellow Sheet Day because teachers had to submit it on a yellow sheet of paper. That's why they called it Yellow Sheet Day. We call it Yellow Sheet Day but there's no paper involved so I'm not sure why we stick with it. Anthony Muhammad said <laughs> <it would be. laughs> no. Yellow Sheet Day. Yellow Sheet Day is pretty much, it's basically where I worked with individual departments and we focus on our curriculum uh, mapping. We have curriculum mapping K through 12. It's, it's uniform, it's all the same through our whole entire corporation. The difference is that Chad had this idea of let's narrow down that focus and instead of focusing on a whole entire year, let's focus on nine weeks at a time. So we actually started this in the third, the third nine weeks we started before the third nine weeks began. I worked with individual departments and we really focused on the PLC for essential questions. That's how our maps are set up. And teachers work together to really hone in the standards and how that was gonna be broken down through the nine weeks. One of the most wonderful things that happened in this were the conversations where teachers, I'm just gonna use an example, a geometry teacher was talking about, you know, these are some critical vocabulary words that I would really like for students to know in Algebra 1 before they come to me. So then we started having conversations about shared vocabulary. How are we defining that vocabulary? How are we really focusing on that? Our conversations got deeper. Um, we actually um, would, uh, we would, <laughs> we would add our assessments to this as well. Um, we have a lot of new teachers, they didn't have the assessment. So when we started this then again on the fourth nine weeks, teachers would then look at the third nine weeks, they would make tweaks to that, and they would then download the assessments that they had used. Um, they were really uh, mindful about how they would plan uh, what we would do if students didn't understand things, so they would make accommodations and modifications to their assessments too. That would all be uploaded to the curriculum apps. 
that again the tech department where everything's on one drive you're moving things from google docs into one drive one no so we're having more of a uniform focus on the curriculum so yeah <laughs> I, I would say too that you know the basic idea then is these teachers will take a, a yellow sheet day is how you get a sub. That's how that came. From. So, so we have these teachers are basically in a large group for the whole day, and all they're doing is just plotting out their curriculum for the nine weeks. Uh, the big thing PLCs the PLC will do is it goes from an invitation to learn to guaranteeing. So what we're really looking at is what is going to be the guaranteed curriculum that we are going to teach these students over these nine weeks. What we want to be able to do is eventually get to the point where we can post these on a website or on the web where a, teacher, a parent can say, okay, you know, U.S. history, third nine weeks, these are the topics. So, you know, you have an idea of what's going on in that classroom, really guaranteeing that curriculum. Um, if you just said, hey, go do a curriculum math, well, we could have done something, but it would have sat on the shelf and not really been any good. This is a, a living, breathing document that is really a, a great use for their teachers, whether they've been around for a long time or some of the, the new teachers can do guidance and really appreciate everything that uh, Stacy does help me along the way. It's been great. Uh, we go back one second. Sorry. You know, we're still working on uh, common form and assessments. You're going to see those in some of our classes. We do a great job, uh, especially with our Math 10 and, and also in, in, in our English uh, RTI. We do a really, really good job there. Uh, we're working on the others. I mean, it's, it's, it's a process. So we still got some growth there. Our tiered intervention, our RTI right now, and math and English language arts is, is the tops. Uh, I, I, it's a lot of fun. I'll have principals call me. I certainly brag about it whenever I can. Uh, again, this would be math and English just absolutely killing it here. And then the enrichment part is something where everybody, that's, that's kind of the last part that you get to, so we've still got some areas of growth there. One word you learned uh, when you go to the PLC conference, they talk about collaboration. And uh, unfortunately, sometimes when you don't do PLC right, it just becomes a bunch of teachers just blabbing on and on, and it can kind of get negative and not about the kids and not about the learning. I think you can tell by all these guys and all the work, it's truly collaboration, and they do a great job. So I'm really, really proud of everything that they're doing. OK. Um, all right, Steph and Karen, you guys want to come up? OK. Uh, you guys remember uh, last November, I think it was, we talked about pathways, and or maybe it might have been even before that, we just talked about what does that mean, and so I kind of wanted to just uh, go through where we're at, just look at the senior class, give you guys an idea of, of how does that all work and everything, and so guys, jump right in uh, if I say anything wrong, okay, good. Um, so we have 140 seniors, and as you can see, we have uh, 82 core 40 diplomas, okay, so that would be the 44 credits. Uh, that would be uh, students, too, that passed uh, both ISEPs, okay? So 82 out of 44, uh, 23 technical honors, 36 academic honors. Now, those those kids could be both, right? So they don't think that they're separate, different kinds of kids. They're, they get your core 40 and a technical, or core 40 and an academic. And you could actually get a core 40 technical and an academic. But just to give you an idea of how that breaks down. Uh, but here's the big one I wanted to show you guys. There's 51 students. And again, I want to stress, this is potential, if everything goes according to plan right now, which these guys do a great job really staying on top of, uh, of our students to make sure. So this is just potential data. Uh, we hope to come back uh, you know, later in the summer and be able to tell you officially. Uh, but right now, 51 students would graduate using a pathway. So without pathways, that would mean that 51 students would need a waiver. Uh, so that just goes to show you how big of a change this really is. And I think there's still some questions out there about pathways, but this is one of the really good things about having the graduation pathways. So 51 students graduate that way. Uh, we have one student on a general diploma. That's usually the, and I'm not 100%, but actually I think I am. The, the big hang up there is Alpha 2. Alpha 2 is the one real difference between a, a core 40 and a general diploma. That's, that's just really hard for some students to get over. Uh, we have 15 early graduates this year. We have three certificates of completion, so that would be a functional skills uh, student to see that would be. Uh, we will have three fifth-year seniors that are right now are, are planning on coming back and working with Micah that just, for whatever reason, maybe got caught further behind their freshman and sophomore year and couldn't get back. And we all know what a great job Micah does at work it. And then uh, Stephanie wanted me to stress to you guys that this is just potential, right? She likes to come in really low or like promise really low and way overperform. Right now, uh, we're looking at 97.8, uh, which would be outstanding, and that would be a, an increase over last year, which I think was 94. Right? 
Okay, okay. aspiration 94.2. So, uh, again, though, that, that's, that's the, also the pathways really helped us out with that. Uh, any questions on where we stand right now? That's great. All right. Okay, I'll stop talking and you guys go ahead and talk about guidance. So we've started scheduling students for the next year. I've been to the middle school to talk to the incoming freshmen and we had parents night. It was a great turnout because the incoming class of 2023 has different graduation requirements than everybody before. Um, they're kind of required to do a pathway or one of the honors diplomas. So we want to make sure the parents and students understand that. And I think it's great that we offer so many pathways here. We've got 15 different pathways that the incoming class can take. So I think it's wonderful that our school offers that. New classes, what we're offering all students, um, AP World History instead of just regular World History, so they have the potential to earn a college credit. And then a cybersecurity class, we were lucky enough to get a grant to help pay for that. And then um, upcoming AP tests, we have a record number of students taking AP tests this year. So we offer tests right now in environmental science, English literature, composition, chemistry, Calculus BC, and some of the students will be taking several of those subject tests this year. Yeah, I just want to talk just a minute. If you guys remember, we came and just talked about rigor and how that all works. And so, this is a record number of tests, and with that also is on top of all the ACP and all the dual credit that don't involve a test. So these are 64 students taking at least one, and really even multiple, multiple AP tests. Uh, this is a great thing for us. I mean, just really. Uh, take us to the next level and provide those opportunities for kids, uh, but providing this rigor, uh, this is huge. An upcoming event we wanted to share is, um, it's called the GPS to Success Career Expo, and um, the Class Gasco County the Chamber of Commerce hosts that, and so our upperclassmen will have the opportunity to attend that on April 17th, um, along with a lot of other area schools. And many students can connect with um, internship uh, opportunities, and some even line up jobs for summer or even if they're seniors potentially after graduation. So it's a really great um, opportunity for our students. There's a lot of local businesses from the county there that are participating, so it's really great. Um, we also wanted to share about the Work Ethics Certificate. It's a new initiative with the state of Indiana. Um, and we've been collaborating with other uh, local schools. Um, we currently have 37 seniors on track for that. It's a very rigorous criteria they have to go through with attendance and their GPA and also um, completing community service or work experience hours. So there's several rounds they go through uh, for eligibility and evaluations. Um, so we're very proud of those students. There are certain incentives they can get um, if they receive that certificate. Some employers will honor that with um, guaranteed interviews or um, hiring at a little bit higher wage. Um, and there's even some tuition assistance with Ivy Tech. So it's a, an exciting opportunity for some of our seniors. Okay. Any questions? Thank you. All right. Next up. By the way, checking it out, camping out. It's all about the kids. It's all about the kids. Okay, so by the week, that was. Okay, so to earn some money, we had a, a teachers could wear jeans for a week for some donations, and then we had the spirit days. Spirit Days were Retro, PJ Day, Athletic Day, Nerd Day, and on Friday we had Wear Red for Riley Day. And all week uh, kids could put, uh, wear hats, so that brought in a little bit of extra money. And then uh, two times that week we brought around the igloo ice cream and sold wagon uh, snacks out of wagons to earn a little bit of money. And also during the mall games we did the igloo ice cream. To win at competitions, and the juniors won that. Um, uh, semi formal dance, we had 107 kids come, so it was pretty good attendance for a dance.
$5,000 and Mr. Kreska and Mr. Craig would put on the sumo wrestling costumes and wrestle. And sorry, Mr. Craig, but Mr. Kreska let you win that last round. <laughs>
part, and then Sarah Tucker got first place in beef cattle placement, and Jeremy Geigen got second place in ag services. Also last year, Shaley Schreiber got first place in beef cattle entrepreneurship, and Jack Cutter got first place in ag services. So all the first place winners go to state, and then Ramey Shoup won district uh, state farmer. Uh, coming up events, we'll have uh, livestock judging, and then uh, state weldings on April 8th, 9th. Uh, oh, and then FFA always helps with uh, Costco School Ag Day. So we go there and it's really interesting time. We take kids on guides and they listen to presentations put on by the students. Uh, 25 members will participate in district leadership contests. So we each do different events like forestry or uh, there's a motors group and other events. And then the National Soils team is competing first week in first week of May in Oklahoma. And then we were voted outstanding FFA chapter over 22 schools in our district. So that's pretty cool. Come on down. 
Tyler, you're the gold medal uh, at our state of solo ensemble, so we're going to have them uh, talk about how that happened and how that got done. <coughs> They're all yours. All right, so um, in August, I believe I picked out a song on a selected list, and I sang Bill Piacere, and then I practiced that until for like a long time. And then on, <laughs> then on January 26th, I went to Districts and I sang my song and I got a gold medal at that. So I had two or three more weeks to practice. And then I went to Indy on February 16th, I believe. I sang there and then I got another gold medal. Oh yeah, it's my second year going to state. Last year I went. I sing Ave Maria, but I got a silver medal. So you're a senior? Yes. What's your plan? Um, I plan on attending Columbia College Chicago, and I want to get a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Musical Theater. Dakota, I forgot to ask you, what, what was your plan for next year? Uh, I plan on going to Indiana University Kokomo, and maybe it's like computer science. Great. I can tell you guys, I know Mr. Connolly, you were there. Uh, Carla got to sing the national anthem in the Unified uh, State Championship, and it was, uh, she was blew the roof off uh, the cold practices. She was really, really good. So, great job. We'll see her again this weekend, the musical Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and then, last but not least, we have two Jack, but uh, Mr. Molesso, are you here? I don't think either one's here tonight. No, they are not here. You want to come up and just tell us a little bit sure. about it? Uh, I know that Fernanda did really, really well, uh, so why don't you just take a minute and just talk about uh, Jag and, and, and how these kids did down at the competition. Great. So, uh, in February at South Bend at the Croc Center, we had uh, the Regional Jag Career Development Conference. And part of the conference are multiple competitions with various uh, skills that are tested. Autumn Buell, uh, working with her specialist at Burkitt, uh, Tanya Boat, uh, she competed in the employability skills competition. And for the second year in a row, she qualified for state. She won it this year. Uh, she was second both uh, at region and at state last year. This year she won uh, region, but unfortunately was unable to attend uh, the state conference. Um, and then uh, my student, uh, Fernanda, uh, she competed in the writing skills competition, and she steadily kept improving, practicing, uh, problem solving, and there was just progress uh, throughout it. She won at region, and then um, once you win at the regional level in the writing skills competition, then you are able to work with a technical advisor to help you prepare for the state competition. And she worked with Dr. Engel and uh, submitted her essay. It's a live essay, kind of like a college essay exam format at the regional level. Then you can take that, work with your technical advisor, uh, modify it, uh, and submit that at the state competition. You also have a very brief interview and uh, a language skills uh, written exam, or a multiple choice exam. And so she did very well there, got second place in the entire state.
some visitors. Is there anyone here that would like to speak to the board this evening? Okay. We're going to move right on to approval of the consent agenda. Number one, approve the minutes of the February 14, 2019 executive session. Number two, approve the minutes of the February 18, 2019 regular meeting. Number three, approve the hiring of the following personnel. Randy Dottie, instructional assistant, Minton Elementary. Brandon Oswald, custodian, Minton Elementary. Devin Amber, instructional assistant, Minton Elementary. Billy Gilman, technology associate, school corporation. Brooke Preska, speech language pathologist, Minton Elementary School. Number four, heard the following extracurricular assignments. Evan Boggs, assistant track coach, the middle school. Jasmine Cords, assistant soccer coach, the middle school. Casey Wise, assistant football coach at the high school, Carl Weaver, assistant football coach at the high school, Lauren Molinari, assistant track coach at the high school, Casey Wise, assistant track coach at the high school, and Hope Massengill, assistant track coach at the high school. Five, accept the resignation of the following personnel. Eric Carlin, assistant track coach at the high school, <coughs> Meredith Adams, instructional assistant at the elementary, and Sheena, Instructional assistant at the high school. Number six, approve the following maternity leave. Shadra Adams, third grade teacher at Akron Elementary. Number seven, approve the out of state trip for the high school soils team. Number eight, approve the out of state trip for the high school, high school livestock judging team. And number nine, approve the out of state field trip for the high school French class. Your motion to approve the consent agenda as read. Mr. Adam, I'll make that motion to approve the consent agenda as read. Thank you, Aaron. Do I hear a second? Second. Uh, Is there any further discussion on the consent agenda tonight? All right. All in favor, state by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, state by saying no. Motion carries. We'll move on to oh, claims and payroll. We have one pre-written claim listing this evening dated February 28, 2019, in the amount of $668,650.03. Uh, our regular claim listing is dated March 18, 2019, in the amount of $87,872.02. We have two payrolls this evening dated February 8, 2019, in the amount of Three hundred eighty-one dollars four hundred sixty-six. I'm sorry, three hundred eighty-one thousand four hundred sixty-six dollars and eighty-seven cents. February twenty-second, two thousand nineteen, in the amount of three hundred sixty-nine thousand seven hundred eighty-one dollars and seventy-one cents. I submit these claims and payroll. Do I hear a motion to accept claims and payroll? And I make a motion to accept the claim to bear on this bill. Thank you. Do I hear a second? I'll second. Is there any further discussion on the claim to bear on this evening? All in favor, state by saying aye. 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 All opposed, state by saying no. The school board has been provided the reconciled bank statement monthly financial report of the funds for the month of February 2019. In summary, our receipts Receipts for all funds: one million six hundred fifty-three thousand nine hundred thirty-seven dollars and eighty-four cents. Total disbursements for all funds: one million five hundred forty-seven thousand three hundred fifty-five dollars and forty-five cents. Thank you, Blaine. Move on to old business. Approval of school board policy changes in section one. Yes, I provided you with uh, some changes uh, in the first uh, section of our school board uh, policy manual. Uh, one was uh, deleting the assistant superintendent from the uh, uh, school corporation uh, history of the, of the Tippecanoe Valley School Corporation, and then also updating phone numbers uh, that, that needed to be changed within that policy. So uh, there are no uh, objections. We section one for school board policy. Do we hear approval for the 
policy changes on section one? Do I hear a second? Second. All in favor, state by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, state by saying no. Motion carried. Move on to new business. Uh, we'll accept the following donations that I, that I talked about uh, in the spotlight. So um, we've got Tucker Golden Beef LLC, Northern Indiana Community Foundation, uh, Donors Choose, and then Woodlawn Hospital. Do I hear motion to open? Accept the following donations. I'll make that motion now. We accept the donations. Do a second? I'll second that motion. Thank you. All in favor, state by saying aye. 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 All opposed, state by saying no. Move on to number two. Uh, we've got a set of donations here uh, to approve from the uh, Kosciuszko County uh, Endowment Youth Services Keys Grants. Um, we've got $2,817 being awarded to different teachers within our school corporation. Uh, our teachers do a great job of writing these grants and Lori works with them and helps them uh, submit those grants. Uh, we, we've got four really good initiatives here. As you look at uh, Kylie Gast, a kindergarten teacher, uh, her, her grant is focusing on Play With a Purpose and uh, Rosie Jansma has some technology for an iPad pilot project. Uh, Deb Miller, um, Akron Elementary uh, Guidance Counselor. Uh, she's got calming box materials working with students um, with, the, with the SEL aspect of her job. And Mr. Dan Franklin, uh, here from the high school, the industrial technology teacher, um, residential construction modules is what he has uh, gotten his grant for. So we would, uh, we would ask that you would uh, approve these grants. The great thing about Keys, um, we, this, this is a uh, they're granted by a student panel um, that goes through all of these grants. We've got some valley kids, but then there are kids from all over Kosciuszko County that look at all the different grants, and you see that, that our teachers do a great job, and we're, we're always awarded several grants from our school corporation, so we appreciate that leadership opportunity. Gentlemen, do I hear a motion to accept the following key? <laughs> Second. All second. All in favor, state by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, state by saying no. Um, I'm asking uh, as we look at uh, our section two of our school board policy manual, in uh, in section 2.3, we will delete the assistant superintendent's um, recognition within there. That that position is no longer in our school corporation. In section 2.4, we will add. Uh, moment of silence, pledge of allegiance, roll call, and upcoming board meetings. Within that, uh, we're just really cleaning up the order of that um, for, for future meetings. Uh, 2.5, uh, the boards from, from several years past, uh, they, they had attended national school board association conferences, uh, and I think that was before uh, the state association was, uh, was very active that's a, a focus that we would like to move towards so we would take out that national part and strike that and then add the Indiana School Boards Association Conference as something that uh, our board would have <coughs> the opportunity to attend. Um, in 2.7 we're renaming uh, these are these are different organizations that, that we uh, belong to as a school corporation we're renaming North Central Association of Colleges and Schools to Advanced Ed they do our accreditation for, uh, for, for our school corporation. We're adding the Indiana Small and Rural Schools, Indiana Association of School Business Officials are uh, and, uh, two more uh, associations that we belong to. I didn't realize that would be that dark up there. I wouldn't have highlighted it that way, I apologize. Um, but you do have this in your, on your board docs, or you will. Um, we've changed on 2.8. Um, our attorney uh, that, that we use uh, from Indianapolis, from Bozeman, Kenny, and Evans to Lewis Capus, uh, and that was that was made um, probably about five years ago. Uh, section 2.5, uh, talking about uh, it was decided that, that we wanted to, to remove the, the $62 uh, for attendance at special meeting meetings that board members um, could receive. 
um, so we're taking that out of out of the, the, the board policy here. Um, and as a school corporation, we, we appreciate that and how we um, just are trying to focus funds on the classroom. Um, section 2.12, um, we changed board members receiving a, a complimentary ticket to uh, the, the sectional basketball, football from one, or I'm sorry, from two to, to one ticket per individual. That had been the past practice for several years, and I don't know um, when that when that went away, but we just really want to update the, the policy in terms of what we're doing. And then the, the chain of command, uh, you'll have the, the, the old uh, chain of command and then the, the proposed uh, on-board docs to, to compare those, and that's really taking the assistant superintendent's position out of that uh, out of that old chain of command and realigning uh, our different uh, personnel that way so we will uh, i'll bring these back to you uh, in april and uh, as we have questions we can we can find those but that's my initial proposal here I'm not asking for approval uh, in this meeting but just talking about that under uh, the initial consideration uh, in new business Moving on, um, we've got uh, our Go Open, exciting. Um, Lori and Tanya, you guys want to both come up? And, yeah, why don't you come up here? Go. It's in a, um, an impressive league of school corporations. 
um, East Noble School Co Corporation, Hamilton Southeastern Schools, Noblesville School District, MSD Warren Township, and MSD Southwest Valley. So, congratulations to you. They've been doing this um, on their own uh, forever to supplement their curriculum. Uh, I went with them to a, a Creative Commons workshop last week so we learned more about copyright law and the right way to do it. And they are a rock star team. They are ready to go. Um, I loved it when the, the group was asked, you know, what do you have to say about um, using the Creative Commons? You know, what do you think? One teacher said, um, it's about we. It's about a community. It's about collaboration. And the other teacher said it boils down to doing what's best for kids and for using the best resources for our kids. And the last teacher said um, this is going to be a game changer for the Valley. So, the other teacher, go ahead. Just to add to that, I met with the LA team before they went down and talked about all of this after Lori and I had gone to an initial meeting and um, talked to them about what it would take. As you know, when we adopt textbooks, it's a six year adoption cycle. So this is a six-year commitment by this ELA team. I will be meeting with them this summer. They've already got their curriculum maps that they've been working on with Stacy that she talked about earlier. But we'll be looking at that and plugging in the materials that will be used to support that in the classroom. And we'll start this summer really building that. Then every year, I'll be meeting with that team again to go through that and see what we need update, you know, new things that have come out so that that curriculum and his living and breathing document that's always updated and our kids are always getting the most recent, most relevant materials. I think as a parent, you know, I'm excited that, um, and, and two, we went on a school site visit um, last week and I had this um, quote that one of the, the ladies said, it just really sticks in my mind, is that um, isn't it cool? Isn't it great when you're a small rural district that you can pivot easier? So we can make changes um, to really be competitive with our academics, and um, it'll be a game changer. So, so we're also hoping because this is our pilot group that we're starting with, um, our rock star team. We're hoping that as we move forward year after year, that we can start adding other grade levels or other um, textbooks. That, that we go to this format instead of adopting from the textbook company. Um, you know, we, we're just really excited about it and looking forward to the ELA team here at the high school pilot. Good. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you. Want to talk about the innovation planning grant? Yeah. Um, if you remember, um, back in December, we were awarded, or maybe in November, awarded the innovation technology. Um, our grant leadership team in December did a self-assessment um, and we got a 64 page report. Um, it was pretty intensive and a lot of information. Um, also, a couple of the requirements of the grant were using outside vendors for an infrastructure audit and a technology infrastructure and an instructional audit um, as it relates to technology. We um, looked at several different vendors and interviewed them, um, called their resources, talked to their school corporations, and we believe we found the best fit for Tiffany Valley. Um, Riverside Technology um, has been selected to conduct the infrastructure audit. Um, and what they'll be looking at is our high-speed connectivity to the schools, um, data privacy and security, high-quality, low-cost devices in our one-to-one -one initiative, um, digital citizenship, which is so important, and uh, responsible use of quality digital content and resources. And that's where I think those OERs fit right into this. Um, they'll have certified, certified engineers come to all of our schools and walk the perimeter of every classroom to look at the access points and check the connectivity. <coughs> so pretty excited about that. Uh, on the instructional audit, you know, we um, interviewed a couple um, vendors. And when we got to looking at our uh, district accreditation report from November 17, it was really all the data that we were looking for. So it did make sense to use to hire someone to come in to, to give us the same information. So we contacted the state and said, hey, can we have a waiver for that? And use that, reallocate that money for something else. And they said, that's perfect. It really told us um, one of the areas we really need to look at was digital learning environments. So 
we took that um, reallocation and um, it's opening up this evening. We're conducting um, a district-wide survey to our staff, our parents, and our students, grade five through 12. And um, we're so excited about this. The window um, starts tonight. It's open through March 29th. You know, it'll really inform us of what we need to focus on for the next five years. And I can't wait to hear from the students what they think about our technology, about our culture, and what we need to focus on. Um, so that was really an opportunity for us um, through the grant. Um, the grant also required a couple school visits. We went last week to South Putnam Rural School District um, doing one-to-one -one very well. Um, got a lot of great information there that day. Um, we're taking the um, elementary team um, to Washington Stone. Um, they're having a, a parent night. So um, we'll look at that. Really the goal of this grant is um, technology and infrastructure to create student-centered learning involving the effectiveness of technology in innovative spaces and to create next generation classrooms to improve student engagement. So um, we have to have a, a conference and plan by December of 2019. So we'll work on the rest of this year on this grant. Any questions? This will allow us to apply for other grants. That's the main thing on this. Um, the innovation planning grant makes you eligible to, for March of 2020 to apply for the next grant, which would be $50,000. That could be you know, devices, it could be whatever our plan says that Valley needs. Yeah, appreciate it. Very good. Driver's education, <coughs> Mr. Schreiber. All right, just kick back a little bit. I uh, <laughs> had some long meetings before, but uh, just, hey, this is going to be real quick. I uh, just want to come up and talk a little bit about uh, uh, driver's ed, what we've been doing. It's, it's been a while since we had a report. Uh, if you were at the last meeting, um, probably four or five years ago, where you talked driver's ed, it was a bad deal. <laughs> we had, had a parent that their daughter couldn't drive, and it went on and on and on. But uh, driver's ed here, I want to, one, just appreciate uh, uh, the use of corporation car. Uh, one thing that we did, try and keep costs low. And we have not increased the cost of driver's ed since that meeting. Uh, and so $255 for the driving part of driver's ed. And if you uh, look around at driving schools, private driving schools, and there are very few high schools that offer driver's education. Whitco does. I think that's the only one in the area. We get uh, people that want to come here uh, from either homeschool in our community uh, or from other schools uh, because uh, it is so cost effective here. And we couldn't do that um, without uh, the flexibility of the corporation allowing us to use that car. Uh, the other thing we've done that's sort of been a change as technology comes around is the 30 hours of instruction. Um, there are numerous online courses that the state of Indiana counts so students can, when they turn 15, sign up for an online course and do the book work online. And that works for a lot of kids. Uh, one thing that's happened uh, here lately is we've had some interest and really what I'm asking for tonight is the opportunity to offer a summer classroom course like we used to for kids that may want to do that. And again, we penciled that out. We felt that uh, $30 fee, which uh, online they're anywhere from $25 to $50 for these, these courses, uh, but at a fee of $30 per student uh, for that classroom, and then having at least 15 students sign up would allow that class to go. And we would make sure that we don't interfere with any other summer school offering, uh, as far as for those kids that want to take summer PE. Uh, we try to run that. We're limited uh, by regulation of the state. There are a lot of state regulations and code for what you have to do. We can't offer more than three hours of instruction in a day, uh, but we would try to run that so the kids could take a bus out here, uh, be in summer PE class if they wanted to, and then stay, eat lunch, and uh, go ahead and take this class in the afternoon. We'd offer one section um, and then combine that with some driving. So that's really what we're saying uh, right now, or what I was really asking for. Again, the other thing that probably has been an informal 
opportunity is that if there is a student, and, and this is kind of brought up by, by that parent, you know, several years ago, if there's a student who is struggling, who doesn't, in the six hours of, of required driving, pass the class for an additional $25 an hour, they could add hours if they wanted to. Um, the other update or the thing that we've been fortunate enough to do is we became a waiver school a couple of years ago. And if we, um, at the end of the course, add that seventh hour, which is optional for our kids, um, they can take the test with us here in our car rather than at the DMV. And that's something that parents really like. Uh, one, convenience. Um, and, and then two, uh, they're familiar with the instructor, they're familiar with the car. Uh, and so we've been doing that. And uh, the nice thing about that is that uh, uh, they can just walk into the DMV and present their materials and, and walk out with their license. Um, and so they don't have to do that. So it's a lot like what the waiver program used to be here. So it's been a good thing. And so that's really what, what uh, the report is for tonight. We'd like to offer that summer class and continue to do what we've been doing with no fee increase, uh, which I think is a great service to the community. Any questions?
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, page 11. We just basically added the, the same warning the elementary had on the headlights policy just to have clarification in there. Um, we had some concerns come up earlier in the year with that, so just making sure that we're consistent across the board. Page 17. Um, we talked to you guys last month here. Our building our showcase and spotlight about R and R, the reading or mediation times, so and just really listing what we're doing with that. It's the um, on our device policy, uh, some teachers had concerns with just headphones and in ear mugs and things in class, and so we simply added it as a piece to the cell phones, personal devices, headphones or earbuds are allowed to be out inside or making noise during class time. So basically during academic time that stuff's to be put away unless the teacher gives permission to use it for some reason. Uh, um, I think page 21, based on recommendations, so thanks to Mr. Kreska, uh, at the high school we added airdrop to the prohibited list. Um, it's a file here, sharing piece. Of Page 26, addition of a one-week statement to the athletic eligibility. So really that just says you have one week from the time practice is starting to go out for the team. And at that point, you know, we, we close 2018 unless there's a specific situation in the athletic director. Multiplication chart that's going to be available to kids for iLearn. We just wanted to have that in the agenda so they had a for their math classes. Amazing. Pretty simple. All the student handbook changes, staff handbook. There's just some pretty stuff. So, page four is the first one. Uh, we require teachers to put uh, student learning objectives on the board. <coughs> we had posters made for them. We missed the classified staff handbook. Go to the staff email. Most of the classified stuff is exactly the same. I should say TV. Athletic. Okay, athletics line. We'll start there. So, again, just out of the one calendar week deal to participation, then you can join the team within that first week. Uh, just added some. Notation there for coaches that if kids missed uh, practices, that they could be dismissed from the team for poor attendance practices. And then, since we're on a seven period day, seven to eight period day, we shifted the three and a half out of seven periods for eligibility for basically going to be in school half day and participate in that. So, uh, that's it. The athletic coach team. Go to the staff handbook. Where, where, where is that? Is it this one? That's the next one. Uh, right there under your under the cursor. Right here. I believe so. Yep. So go to page four. Like I said, we require teachers to put student learning objectives on the board. Out poster because we made a bunch of posters for them before they fall apart. We just didn't read them. Page 8, we updated the, uh, don't want to know, page 8. We just added in the new web page <coughs> for sub reporting. So, they're the best thing online. These are just the basic directions for where to go. And put information for the out for the Scroll down a little bit here under the cell phone. So basically, just kind of making the staff expectation here, student expectation that the cell phones are going to be put away during academic time. Because we're holding kids accountable for that. We want to make sure we're holding all these counties that same expectation. So, uh, add that. Page nine, field trip fee statement. Basically, 
we're doing the Viking card sales now, beginning of the year every year, and our grade level accounts are, are building up to be pretty healthy because that money goes into the sixth grade, seventh grade, and eighth grade accounts. And so there's a lot of the field trips we take. We don't need to charge them for them because we have that money saved up from the fundraiser. So just put a notation in there that people check with me and we've got the funds. We don't need to turn around and charge kids a field trip fee because we've been doing the fundraiser to build those accounts up so we can do those things. Um, page 10, school safety section. Just added if you see something, say something. Then at the bottom, just a statement about that we follow the I Love You Guys Foundation standard response protocol is our overarching school safety policy. So it's there, the link to what we do is there. Um, page 16, just change the chalk a little one note for a classroom digital platform. Page 19. Added our our time. Page 25, we updated new board members. And then uh, page 26, again, just added headphones and earbuds to the device policy. And just put the new calendar at the end. The classified handbook has all the same changes. So, really pretty simple, just updates and stuff and some minor changes we've made. But nothing, nothing hugely critical shifted in our So, any questions? Changes for you uh, to, to consider and to go over here in the beginning, just really just uh, you know, replacing the new board members and new personnel, uh, nothing uh, too crazy really. We look down here to uh, page uh, 25, that was probably the first place I want to get to, and uh, we're looking at uh, um, the, uh, the Viking Code. Uh, did that right there in the grade reports, and we saw that that just talks about uh, when we'll send out the grade reports. Send them out by mail. It's very expensive. I think Mr. Boggs last year really felt like just at the end of the semester would be the right time to do that. Uh, and really encouraging parents just to get on uh, SDI and, and find out what the kids' grades are and, and those kind of things. But uh, this is this was really something I, I know you want to really talk about and, and really explain what we did here. Um, first of all, we, you know, there's, there's this Viking code that we all talked about. Well, the Russian really ever use that term Viking code in the handbook, so now it's there. Now we know. Um, there's a little ambiguity with the code, is really the problem. And what uh, came up last year is some parents and some students really felt like, okay, so I'm being disciplined for a breaking rule, and then I'm being disciplined not only by the school, but I'm also being disciplined athletically, and then sometimes they were being disciplined by the law. So it was almost like they were getting hit three times, and it, it that, that didn't necessarily spell that out. It also didn't really talk about, well, what are what are those violations? What are those certain violations? And, and also it lumped in things that you probably, what we felt like you should not receive half of your athletic year, for example, if you had three targets. And that's actually the way it was written. And the other part of the issue, the way it was written, it was really kind of left up to the administrator or the athletic director to kind of determine, well, this was a Viking code or this wasn't. It really left us in a bad spot as to Okay, where do we stand? And what happened uh, in, in a couple situations is we had, well, in this situation, this happened, or you guys did this back then. So what we wanted to do is really, really make that cut dry and, 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 and look at those things. So what you see there is rule one, two, and three, and four, they, they really haven't changed. Uh, we just kind of put them together because these are biking code violations. Obviously, if you go out and you're a felony, that's a biking code. Uh, that's obviously a lot different than uh, maybe you copy or copy somebody's homework. Uh, is, are those are the same type of violations, and that's what it was before. And now we want to be able to go to those type of situations and be able to see those differences and make sure that it aligns. Uh, so um, if you scroll up just a little bit, Mr. Conley, you see the Viking code. Again, this hasn't changed. These are the first violations, the second violations, the third violations. Those are what they've always been. But those are if you violate any rules one through four. Okay, and then what we did is we took rule five and said, okay, well, these are not these are not good things. We don't want anybody doing these. But these aren't necessarily things that if you did wrong, you should be receiving you know, half, your, half of your suspension from your, from your athletics. 
or extracurricular activities. So that's what you're seeing. So we just went through there, uh, and this this really came from Mr. Trollmeyer and myself and Mr. Krister really working together and seeing, okay, let's have this make sense so we weren't put in the situation uh, that we were a couple times last year because of just understanding of, well, who decides this and when does this go? Now it's very, very cut and dry as to those types of things. So we certainly want to call your attention to that uh, and, and see that because that is, um, it's a change, but really what we did is just change the order of things and put the other things uh, in, into that range of consequences for rule number five. Any questions on that? Okay. Yeah, I'll show you. Good deal. Um, okay, and then the next one down here is one we really would like you guys to take a look at is our progressive F policy. In the handbook right now, there is a progressive F policy. Uh, there's a lot of issues with this, and we'd like to have this policy uh, completely. Um, obliterated uh, and go away. Um, what, what basically, if you're not familiar with the progressive policy, is that it requires the athletic director uh, twice, basically every four weeks they're doing a grade check, which right now our athletic director does it uh, pretty much <coughs> twice a semester, and is in constant communication. But this meant every four weeks. And so what could happen, so let's say we got Mr. Heckman here, first four weeks he doesn't didn't do a really good job in English. So he had one F in English. Okay, well, he can still participate, but he's got himself one F. And then the nine weeks comes around, he raises English grade, but his math grade slips. Well, that's the second F. And even though he'd be IHSA eligible, what that would do is it would cost him his athletics. Because that'd be a progressive F policy, that'd be two, and he'd be out. Uh, that's really tough. This, this puts a lot of strain and a lot of time. Uh, and Mrs. Romeyer, well, she's willing to do this, and this is what you guys the board would like us to do, but this the, the, the paper trail and tracking this is very hard. Uh, this also, with what we're trying to do in the classroom, with allowing kids uh, to redo assignments that they don't do very well or to, to earn the right to maybe retake a quiz, uh, it also then, it really kind of goes against that. What we're trying to do is get kids to play and be involved, and this really policy kind of works the other way. I understand why the policy was in place, but I think with where we're at and what we're trying to do in the classroom, and then just keeping up with the grades. Now you're really on, on teachers got to really make sure it's not every nine weeks. And yeah, we want our teachers to do that, but accepting in that late work and really staying on top of it, it's really, it, it, it can be very, very difficult. So we'd like you to take a look at that. Uh, and and, and if, if more than anything, if this is something you guys uh, really do want to keep, let us know. We'll follow you and lead in that direction. But our recommendation is, that we need to get rid of this. It's, it's really a lot more even stringent than the IHSA. Uh, you know, by the IHSA rule, you can have two Fs in play, believe it or not. You, you can have it as long as you're passing five solids. You could, not that we want any of our athletes to do that, uh, but make it to where the quarter, and then, you know, then that, that, that one is with you. That, that's tough, and I think that's going to the other end, really going against what we're trying to do uh, in, in the classroom with our teachers. All right, uh, so just, you know, really adding some things here about, you know, cell phones in the locker rooms and what you should and should not be doing with that. Uh, really nothing there. Um, let's go ahead. Uh, there, there's a lot of organizations this year. Um, we have like our band and choir, FFA. Some of our organizations uh, maybe had demands or that you had to meet requirements. Uh, band would be the first one to come to mind. So. Now, if you're in the band and, and you know, Ms. Runner does a great job, she expects you to be at the, the, the pet band. Well, what happens in her rules was if the kid is not at the pet band, uh, and you can only miss so many times, well, then you're no longer going to be in band. Well, we didn't have a policy besides her syllabus stating those kind of things. So what we wanted to make sure that we had that in the board approved policy uh, for band, we have one in the new addition for choir, uh, we have one for FFA, uh, we have Media Center, Student Council is another one that really just lays out, hey, these are their rules. I mean, these may be a little bit different, uh, not necessarily good, but more stringent than what is in there. But if you want to be in these organizations, this is what it takes. And so we wanted to have that backing versus them just saying, okay, well, you're out. Well, they didn't really give us a way to stand on. So we asked you to look at those uh, policies too this year. Uh, we also, on page 67, uh, we had language about uh, uh, sexting and airdropping. Uh, certainly want to make sure we can have a policy. Uh, you know, never thought I would have a policy for those type of things, but we did have an incident here at lunch. Uh, and so now we've got that uh, very much spelled out in the new handbook. 
Uh, if you continue down to 87, uh, page 87, we talked about uh, all smoking devices and, and whether it's vaping, which honestly we haven't seen that much this year. Knock on wood, it's been a really good year. I think it uh, speaks volumes to the job that Mr. Kresge did last year, really uh, hitting, hit, hammering down on people. Uh, and, and I think the word is out that if you do that here at school, you're going to be in trouble and it's going to be a Viking code. And, and so we're not really seeing so much of that uh, as, as what we were in some of the area schools, which is really good. One other thing, too, we added uh, that the items will be confiscated, not given back. We had a couple of uh, well, community members that wanted their child's items back. Uh, I guess it can be rather expensive. I'm not about that. But anyways, we made sure that those are going to handle the law enforcement. They can go handle that issue for them. Uh, and then, of course, too, we added the graduation pathways is now the same thing. So those are your, you know, some changes. The big one there is really the progressive ethics policy and just looking at how we work with the right code. We'd like to take it with us. Um, staff handbook, there's very little in here in the staff handbook. Uh, we followed uh, Mr. Bax's lead. Thank you very much for adding the uh, I Love You Guys Foundation School Safety. Uh, we did add a, a cell phone usage policy uh, for the staff. Uh, we did also make some minor changes with just uh, making sure the right teacher day was in there, uh, how to report an absent to the sub finder, uh, and then just also uh, make sure that uh, we really emphasize and cleaned up how the, the issues we need to call CPS and whatnot to and make sure the numbers in there. So, really nothing to the staff. Students didn't discipline their seniors. That, that's, uh, okay, sure, we can talk more about this. So, okay, go ahead, let me go find my cheat sheet here. Um, okay, I'm reading as I'm going. It just yeah. looks like kind of the, yeah. the, the chain of man was working with teachers and yeah, yeah. It, it, it was really it, more rewording. Okay, yeah. yeah. In, in, the, in the past, there was this whole thing about how a teacher needed to go ahead and call home before they could send the kid down to us. Okay. And Brandon and I were like, "This send it to us. You keep teaching." You got a problem, we'll take care of it, and we'll meet later. And just and then really there was uh, there was paper. They're running a lot of like like three copies and like one copy. Okay. We just just put it on, put it into the student management service and get it to us, and we'll look at it. Really just saving steps there. So yeah, not not a big change there. Just just telling the staff how they do the problem with the more than welcome. Got the back. Yeah. Um, and then athletic handbook is is really just going to hear again what we just did, but it's just now it's also in the athletic handbook talking about what the Viking code is and then, you know, the rule one, two, three, four, five, uh, and then how. And then I guess, too, just, just to talk about rule five a second, if you could just go up just a second, Mr. Conley. You know, these are things where rule five where Brandon and I are like, you know, so, okay, an athlete messes up, okay, that's not a good thing, but a lot of times we have to go to the coach, you know, and just say, hey, can you handle this knucklehead? I mean, they're acting up a little bit, you know, whether that's a little more up-downs or whatever it might be, you know, for a minor violation. And that, that, those are the kind of things that we're talking about here. Or, or maybe, you know, hey, it's, it, it, they do get an in-school or an out-of-school suspension. Those rules are aligned with, with those type of activities. Not that we want any of our athletes to do These aren't things that you should lose half of your uh, parts would be an Obviously, so just kind of give us, give us that stuff. <coughs> Well, uh, this is kind of a personal thing for me because I got a young man in my house that actually fishes some tournaments already. Um, so somewhere down the road, you know, this was going to be a piece that I was going to bring and, and talk about us doing anyway. But I had a group of high school boys come and see me about three weeks ago that are really interested in starting a high school anglers club, which we've had in the past. There's been different times through through our school corporation history that we've had a club here that met and, you know, did trips and things like that together. Um, but what they want to do as a component of this is actually have a team from Tipkey Valley that competes competitively in events. And so when they came and talked to me, we spent some time doing some research, uh, presented some information to Mr. Craig about what it is that we'd like to be doing. But 
what we found and what I shared with you guys in the packet is basically that there's two sanctioning bodies that do high school fishing competitions in the state of Indiana, the Bass Angler Sportsman Society and the FLW Tour. So in our research, what we discovered was the FLW Tour side does tournaments in the north half of the state where bass, are, they're all in the south, so we have to go to the bigger reservoirs in the south to fish. There are longer trips and have to be overnight stuff to be more cost involved. But in essence, we're going to be able to, if you guys approve this tonight, put a group of two high school kids and a group of two middle school kids in four competitive bass tournaments this spring and this <laughs> summer as Tippecanoe Valley's high school team. Uh, the tournaments run in the spring and the summer. Um, competing against other schools. The idea behind the Anglers Club is that we're going to get as many kids at Tippecanoe Valley that are interested in fishing as a sport uh, together and we're going to do local events in the fall. So we'll find some places around here where we can take our kids, do some activities, but part of this is also community service. Part of this is academic. So. I'll pass this down the road, but um, the boys and I sat down and, and talked about sort of the points system a little bit today, and we kind of took a lot of this from other clubs, but in essence, what it is is you start your season in July, and you do local activities. So there's community service in the fall. Uh, you do three to four local competitions with your kids in your club, and they are points. So community service is worth so many points. How they score in the tournaments competing against each other is worth so many points. But there's also, and this is the part I really like, and I know Mr. Craig liked this too when we talked, part of the points is grades, and attendance, and behavior. And so we spend the fall building all these points up, and then the guys that in there, the guys or gals, whoever it is, because it's open to anybody, who finish in the top two spots of the points are your anglers that fish the summer turn or the spring and summer tournaments the next year against the other schools. So in essence, you have your own club, and in your own club, you run this point system that involves all these different things, and then the, the guys that, and gals that finish at the top end are the ones that are going to get to turn around and go represent our school in these activities. There's four tournaments this spring. The first one's in April at Lake Freeman. Uh, there's one on Lake Maxicucky, there's one on Lake Manitou, and there's one on Hamilton Lake, which is up around Kittleville. If our guys or gals that fish in those tournaments qualify, um, the state tournament is in Brookville Reservoir, and if they place in the state tournament in Brookville, the national tournament for the FLW is on Lake Hartwell in Alabama in August. So, you know, there's an opportunity for kids to compete, but more importantly, this is an opportunity for all the kids at Tippecanoe Valley High School that want to be involved in this, and then also middle school component, uh, if we get enough adult support to help, to be involved at the local level doing community service, fishing, having some fun. Um, this spring, we're not going to have time, obviously, to do a point system and get all of that stuff in place in time for the tournaments. So I felt really strongly like the group of guys that have worked to put this together are, are the guys that I'm probably going to take and let them do the, the tournament competitions this year with the idea that we start in July with the whole club and we build towards um, you know, that whole point system and choosing the people based on that point system for next year. Uh, We've got, we've got some money that, that has to happen here. So uh, our goal, we, we met tonight after school and talked, our goal is to get kind of our paperwork and everything ready to go, have a call out meeting over here after spring break. We, we get back, that'll give us time to, to work on forms and work on some activity locations and things. Um, our goal would be to have the call out meeting, see what our numbers look like. It's $25 per kid dues yearly to be in the club, and that $25 pays for their membership in the Student Angler Federation. That federation, if they're a member of that, allows them to fish in the tournaments. It also provides liability coverage for the kids participating in tournaments. So 
know, from an insurance standpoint, the the foundation helps cover what we do. Fishing's a lot of fun and it's primarily safe, but there are some dangers, obviously, being out on the lake, boat, hooks, all that other kind of stuff. So, um, provides coverage, and then the. For the kids to fish in the tournaments, there has to be a coach slash captain in the boat that's an adult. Um, the boat has to be, has to fit the federation guidelines and also be legal by the state. The captain has to have a legal fishing license. And so probably the hardest thing for me is gonna be sitting in my boat for eight hours with two guys when I don't get to pick up the fishing rod. But um, we've got two guys right now, myself, and I think I listed on there that Josh Shepard, a friend of mine, is really interested in helping. Both of us have boats, we both turn them and fish. So we both have experience with that. And, like to be able to take a high school and a junior team this spring to fish in those tournaments and then build the club into next year and potentially get some more kids involved. Um, a couple of these local tournaments, um, the director talked like they would possibly allow more than one high school team from our school. So to do that, we just need to have additional people, adults with boats available to do background check and approve and take the kids, but it's dependent on the tournament. So, you know, we've got bowling, we started soccer, we've done a lot of really cool things around here, and I think you'd be surprised at the number of kids will really get into this and, and have a good time with it. And I think it's a, it's a good opportunity for some of our kids that aren't necessarily our mainstream athletes to be involved and knowing they have to meet like code expectations, knowing that they've got to keep their grades up, knowing they've got to do community service is all a good thing to be able to get involved in something like that. Thing that we would need is for that information to be in on the handbook as a, as a new club. Uh, yeah. You mean, really don't need approval, but this, this information will be put in there. Make sure and you guys there. don't publish yours, it just goes on the internet, right? So I can get it to you whenever it's not a matter of, because we're still tweaking some of those things based on how it's good. I didn't see the part there where you guys said you made my book. <laughs> it might be in the bylaws, <laughs> or maybe there was something about if you can't touch a fish, you can't be in the club. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you you a yeah. Yeah. What kind of startup? Are you guys a startup expense? Are you going to have to ask for some donations? Is that what? So you one of the things, going? one of the things we talked about today, the boys and I got together after school, and they wanted to be here, but they've got baseball practice tonight. My expectation for this is it's not going to take the place of. And I was very clear with those guys that you're not going to skip school sporting events and do this stuff. Um, so what we talked about is that, yes, we, we're going to have to look into getting sponsorships because um, the tournament entry, like, like for this four, four tournament series, it's $85 per <coughs> fish in four tournaments. So if we put four kids in, it's four times $85 just for the entry fee go you know and I don't mind volunteering my time but it would be nice to get some help driving kids to these places with some gas money stuff like that um, so we talked about sort of setting up a fundraiser sheet to go solicit some sponsorships because the cool thing about fishing is they make these really great jerseys with everybody's logos on them you know like splendor boats right in the middle of the street. Um, but the other thing is we a lot of the kids that are talking about this are really excited about getting the jersey. And then we would also probably have a fold-up banner that we would take with us to the tournament. These are outings that we would put up for when we do pictures and a lot of that stuff would get out on social media. So we want to solicit some donations from some local businesses. I talked to the kids about putting a form letter together and mailing it to a lot of these outdoor companies because you know a lot of times you know, if you're going to send, you know, St. Croix rods, that, or you know you're running a club that's doing community service, they may send product to you for the case you used to. So we're looking at all those different avenues. Uh, we've talked to Robert Sines, and they can do a fishing jersey. They just need to design and all the stuff we want to put on it. So, you know, there, there's a lot of cool stuff that we could do with this. The main thing is we want to get it off the ground. We want to get all of the 
sort of that point system set up and get things rolling so that we can move into the fall with opportunities to, to run a whole year series with it. Um, the other cool thing is that the uh, Student Angler Federation allows seniors, so if, if Dylan was in the fishing club and he was on my tourney team, just because he graduates doesn't mean he's done. He would get to finish the entire summer series of tournaments before he finishes with the club. So they continue until that whole summer season is finished. They're not just cut off to a second one. So if people want to donate, they, they would contact me. They would contact me directly. Yeah. Okay. So, about donation for fillets. There's where I'd be in. Well, my thing was, and, and this was the other thing we talked to him about, is that if we do this points thing and we have a top ten and a couple of anglers a year would like to have a banquet, and that'd be a great time to invite local donors and sponsors out and do fish fry for those guys too. So I'm, I'm pretty good at putting those on. We even talked about hooking up with Alliance for one of our community service nights and we can go help serve and just do different things like that. But really like the idea of the Student Angler Federation putting the academics and the community services mandated in this as part of it is not just getting together and meeting up somebody's <coughs> blog or anything. It's doing a lot of other things for outreach and care. So, yeah. All right, that's it. Awesome. Well, I think that's all we have for the city, so we will adjourn.